Welcome back to Synergy Bonus. A bunch of friends that like to sit around and get drunk and talk about games. What are you drinking, Spoon? <laughs> uh, wine. 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 I am drinking... Can, can I be a little more specific? Uh, yes. I'm drinking a Twisted Vine from our local... One of our local wineries, oh, Willow Creek ones. Winery. And it is a New York rosé... Rosé, rosé, table wine. Rosé, rosé. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, it's actually a blend of two oh. of their wines. Yeah, it's a Concord and something else. And it's delicious. It's d delicious. It's Divine. candy. It's heavenly. It's a wonderful it's, thing. It's sweet, but not sickening sweet. It's mm -hmm. a rosé gozé. Oh, <laughs> I've had that. <laughs> I have had the rosé gozé in Brazil. Anyhow, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to wash away a dark, gloomy, rainy day. Well, and a spectacular week. As are they all. Mm -hmm. All right. So, down to business. Down to business. All right. Today we are talking about a, uh, what would you call it, a setting, I guess? Setting. Yeah. Setting. It's a, a setting for the D20 system. Fuck <laughs> off. Uh, for the D20 system. I powered um, through mine. I'm sorry. <laughs> I saw that. Uh, that's a hint about how good this stuff is. Seriously, mm -hmm. Willow Creek Winery. Look them up. Um, <laughs> Craig's like, no, no. Uh -uh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited. You brought a knife to a wine fight? <laughs> he did. Wait, I brought multiple weapons. <laughs> he means his penis. All right. But, <laughs> but in all well, seriousness. The less we talk about the need holger, the better. <laughs> but in all seriousness, Trev. It's a, a setting for... Um, D20 system based under, or it was published under Sword and Sorcery, um, which at the time was owned by White Wolf. I didn't know that. I think I did. Yeah. Through the um, joys of the OGL. Yeah. Um, but licensed to Goodman Games because it was written by Josh Goodman. Uh, it's called Dragon Mech, published originally in 2004, about the same time that sweat brands were <laughs> relevant and Less Than Jake was a thing. So. Uh, <laughs> so what? We have a theme today. Yeah, 2004. Apparently yeah, the theme is that I'm old. Uh, no, don't don't everybody uh, object at once. <laughs> this is the worst part here. You're the oldest one here, and Greg is showing it more. <laughs> it's just because the light doesn't catch my silver. I've been showing it more for years. He's a shower, not a grower. I'm get it more in my non-existent facial hair. <laughs> you get. This is two weeks right here. So is this. I shaved when I went <laughs> on the patch. Nicotine patch. We've talked about this. <laughs> this is two weeks. Growth. I hate you both. All right. So 2004, <laughs> Dragon Mech, Sword and Sorcery. Okay. So Dragon Mech is close to my heart for a number of reasons. The first one close being, to mine, yeah, too. The first one being that this game started because of a drunken bet. There were two game designers. Uh, it was Josh Goodman, and I forget who the other one was. We were sitting around, having a few drinks, talking about game design, as you do. Um... And the other guy bet Goodman that he couldn't find a way to shoehorn Mecca into Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Josh Goodman said, hold my beer. And about a year later, he came out with this wonderful setting. Um, and it does exactly that. It's got a whole bunch of these really steampunky, gear-driven... Um, mechanical monstrosities stalking across the landscape, uh, fighting each other, fighting dragons, occasionally picking up poor unfortunate orcs and dropping them into their arm cannons. And then shooting them. Did I do that? You yes, did. you did! <laughs> that was a group consensus, I think. But you were the pilot. I know I was. <laughs> Honestly, if I agree to any plan in the group... That should be enough justification to look at a different But player. it worked. It did. It did work. Okay, so it did work. Mechanically, this is designed to basically work with 3.5 edition D&D, &D, a little tweaking, and it works pretty fine with Pathfinder. And we found a few plausible adaptations into 5th edition Dungeons mm. and Dragons. Um, mm. But really, it, it'll work with any D20 system, uh, although it's very much intended to be 3.5 edition. Um, the big gimmick behind this one is that we're on this central world called High Point, the distinguishing feature of which is ridiculous tides that change based on the seasons to a rise and fall of about 30 feet. 
you guys didn't get that far. No, no, we didn't. Um, the second major, or beyond that, the land is very is very flat. So most tribes, you know, and species aside from dwarves who have to tunnel wherever they are, we're fairly nomadic. Um, the second major feature. <laughs> If you bring up beach dwarves... No, it's not beach dwarves. Okay. Different game. Uh, game. The second major feature of this setting is that the moon... That was... was ...played a little too much Legend of Zelda and is crashing through the atmosphere and the atmosphere's friction is just tearing the surface of the moon off and launching it down... Uh, on the surface of so it's point. very cratered, um, and yeah, so, there's yeah. moon creatures, yeah. and it's and so there's meteorites that are smashing into everything. There's just particulate dust in the air at all times. There's actually like charts involved that you can roll on to see how thick the dust is to see how much protection you need from the abrasive moon dust at any given time. Um, and it brought with him, as he said, creatures that were indigenous to the lunar body. Now the setting picks up. I about, final fancy. <laughs> Yeah, the setting picks up eh, 200 years after the moon first crashed into the atmosphere, so it's kind of post-apocalyptic steampunk. Uh, the apocalypse has happened or is happening in slow motion. Several human generations have come and gone. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's only a few long-lived dwarves and some of the very few elves that survived that remember the time before, um, and society has moved on. And one of the big things that society needed to do to move on was find a way to transport goods from this city to that city because a lot of the dwarven cities, being underground, survived the devastation. Uh, So it's a setting where dwarves actually rose to be the dominant species in the world. Um, Up with the little people! Screw the dwarves. (laughs) However, if you say anything about an up with dwarves leaves, dwarves league... I'm getting away from you, but screw your dwarf-tossing games. Screw most of the elves. The drow are very prosperous in this particular setting. Because, one, they were underground. So they were protected from the the lunar rains, as they come to call these things. But two, they came up when the uh, dwarves came together in um, their major governing body is the uh, Stenian Confederation. And the, the drow convinced the leaders of the Stenian Confederation that they would set up a buffer in a lot of the subterranean cities, uh, making this outlying zone, where they would keep all of the nasty things in the Underdark away from the settlements so that the surface dwellers could be safe from the lunar rains. In true drow fashion, they didn't bother to tell the Stenian Confederation that the drow themselves were probably the scariest, nastiest <laughs> thing down there. <laughs> um, but they become a, a very important... Uh, factor in the game once you get away from the introductory stuff Um, because they control a a significant amount of trade throughout everything. But before the drow made their alliance, um, the big thing the Stanian Confederation came up with in trying to unite all of these city-states that are the remnants of once great dwarven empire was a mode of armored transportation on legs Mm. to get across the broken landscape the way treads couldn't. And so we have these giant stone and metal mechs developed by the dwarves. So it's kind of like a the metal. gear that's bridging the gap between mechanized warfare and mankind. A eh? metal gear. Stone. Stone <laughs> gear. There you go. Um, what a time to be alive. Eh? <laughs> um, and I really wish I had more wine. <laughs> yeah, too bad. And uh, the... The other species were well done. We were quick to pick up on this uh, on this kind of thing. The the, um, the elves are like, well, if the dwarves can do it, we can do it better with nature. So they made a whole bunch. No, of, you can't. No, you no, really no, can't. you can't. Because you know, your your, trees, your your tree fortress is vulnerable to fire, and we have projectile weapons. That or projectile and, orcs. <laughs> Giant flaming chunks of rock coming from the sky. Mm, yeah. Like all of the great elven forests are gone. They're predominant uh, mech because each of the races have put together one or more super giant mechs that they call city mechs that um, are the major population centers for the non, uh, non-fixed non localization um, cities and populations. Uh 
to make their big tree mech, they took like all of the remaining living trees and grafted them together into this giant monstrosity. So what you're saying, Lot, is we take out the elven city, me uh, city mech and we'll be finally free of the tree menace. Yep. Thank you, Order of the Stick. Yes. I am. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm surprised. Wow, has it made an expansion of this? Uh, maybe all the. It, it literally sounds something straight yeah. out of Wow. Like, um, hey, this expansion. There's a moon crashing down. Guess what? Darkness hey. is now a mobile city. Hey, gnomes, do your thing. <laughs> yeah. Actually, gnomes are pretty much almost extinct in this setting because. And yet, I played. Yes. Yeah. Um, halflings have evolved or have evolved, I guess into what they call coglings because, you know, their little caravans didn't work anymore. That's why I should have given them the moonstone. So they, ha. So they started hiding out, like, in the nooks and crannies of the dwarven mechs yeah. wherever they could. And so they, they started becoming this sort of pseudo-subterranean species that hides, like, in the walls, like weird little rat folk kind of thing. We call them coglings, and they smell awful of oil and uh, other mechanical stuff, and they worship the machines as gods. Okay, it's I kind of feel bad now because when you mm. described them when we were playing it as they're well, they're coglings. It's like okay, they're not a sapient species. I shouldn't <laughs> feel bad if I kill them. They're they're they're, they're sapient, really, but they're the the wretched descendants of the halfling race. So I really shouldn't feel bad about that. I, um, all I can think of was the Grommels now. Hello, friend of the Grommel. What's your? Deal? That's that's kind of weird, yes. in my head. That's you are lucky do. Um, and they found different ways of defending themselves like going back to the elven mechs um, where, the, where the, um, the dwarven mechs all have these giant steam cannons and flamethrowers and oversized swords and axes the elves went well a tree branch is basically a wand so I'm going to make an 80 foot long wand of fireball <laughs> that's pretty ridiculous yeah Just now you don't have a wand just, I have a lot of branches. Here's seven more. I just, I just thought of they all fire at once. Something just wielding a tree. This is my wand. No, that's a tree. What are you talking about? The most fucked up one is somebody out there, um, and the, I don't have all the splat books to know the full like meta plot behind it. Made a necromatic mech, and it, it's a giant flesh golem. Yeah, it started with the corpse of a giant, and they just been adding corpses to it for about 50 years now. It's kind of impressive, actually. So it's the size of a city mech, and it's just all undead. That is a Castlevania yeah. boss. You can, yeah, Legion. <laughs> and you can smell it coming from miles away across the plains. That is disgusting, yes. and a Castlevania boss, and I love um, it. And then you have the orc mechs, which... The orcs didn't actually make their own mechs. What they did was that they stole mechs from humans and dwarves and added and they decided that they didn't really understand or trust all this creepy machinery happening inside these giant suits of armor so they tore it all out didn't move them all of a sudden they just had the superstructure so they decided on the you know the old tried trust and through theory <laughs> slaves <laughs> they capture other races or other lesser tribes of orcs and put them to work like moving the legs and arms of the mech physically by manpower which actually Going with Warhammer 40k, that's how the orcs kind of treat titans. We don't understand this. We're gonna yell at it. It, it works. works. No. Same kind. Yeah, yeah. Orcs in this setting definitely warg. Um, warg. Yeah. Not warg. You meant, but I understood. That red one goes faster. So a mech saw the shit. What else is new to Dragon Mech? Uh, well, there's a few new races that are indigenous to High Point. Um, there's this weird fish people race that I didn't really look into. Shahagan? No. Oh, okay. uh, they're actually some sort of sylvan race. Mm -hmm. um, and then, my personal favorite, the Tortogs. A giant anthropomorphic tortoises who became very slow overland traders because their thick skin and shells mean they're immune to the lunar dust. <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Merchants. <laughs> Oh, Traders on a half shell. <laughs> Traders <laughs> on a half shell. Uh, Tortog um. power. Uh, actually, their favorite class is um, ranger. So, uh, well, if you do a little ranger, and you're good enough. Sneaking. There's a whole bunch of new classes, uh, and this I'm going to step back into the lore a second here. Um, part of the reason the moon fell is that there's a celestial war going on between the greater gods of the setting. Um, they don't because it's a, one of those D and D multi-setting things. They have the same. Mm gods but the names are slightly different 
Muradin, so, Moradin. That, that kind of thing there. You have, I am Corellian Lust. But you have like this, I am Moments. But you have the standard, you know, here's the Dwarf Father, here's the God of Travel, here's the God of Tricksters. Vecna shows up in one of his various forms. Um, Followed you know, with Kaz. Palor and Hexator are there and so on. Um, but they're all caught up in a celestial war, very reminiscent of like the, um, the Chaos War series from Dragonlance, where the gods are around, but they're not actively participating. Uh, how this plays out mechanically is that every day when your divine spellcasters wake up, there's more or less a 50% chance that their spells just don't work that day. So, don't tell them. Yeah. So people started losing faith in the gods, which further weakened them, which further met, or strength, or, but the lunar gods don't have that problem because their followers believe in them just fine. So the terrestrial gods are losing the celestial war. <laughs> to the invading alien gods. Um, so people turn to the arcane casters, the wizards and the sorcerers and such, hoping that they would be able to help them and protect them and save them. Well, it turns out um, they've added a new a subtype of creature, the lunar subtype. Specifically, the lunar dragon is the big thing that pops into the series. Mm -hmm. And it turns out if you've got the lunar subtype, you have damage reduction to all elemental types. This is before they created Force Element, which was just straight arcane damage. Right. So, damage reduction against fire, damage against fire. Um, so these spellcasters stepped and they're like, I've got this fireball! And it oh, just crap. bounces off the dragon. So people started losing faith in the, uh, in the arcane casters. Um, and so, you know, nobody's got a use for evocation. It's basically fallen by the wayside. Other things like illusion and conjuration and stuff are still... Transmutation. Transmutation. Um, <laughs> necromancy, obviously. But, you know, evocation and other attack spells, not so much because they don't do shit against lunar dragons. And when you've got a you know colossal lunar dragon tearing apart a city mech, peppering him with useless fireballs doesn't help anybody. No. Take that, elves. <laughs> another reason that the elves are in such dire straits and have become a endangered species unless you're a drow. Oh, they should have chosen a better band. Ha ha. Um, what's arisen instead is a sort of a, a steampunky science. Cog layers, steam wizards. Um, mech jockeys. Mech jockeys are the piloting class. Praise Dotrek! And a new religion surrounding the machine god. Uh, well, Godlin. He hasn't become a god. Yet he's on his way to though. Must assassinate him. And also, so steam, also steam powered cyborgs are a huge thing in this setting. And rocket launchers. Rocket launchers. Yep. Um, it can always be rocket. <laughs> I don't need magic or gods. I have a rocket launcher. <laughs> so, but um, I mentioned the cog layer. Their basic thing is that they build devices that mimic spells and so on. Anything from steam powered guns to um, we had one guy who built a, a blood transfusion machine and hooked it to a drill bit. Oh, yeah, I remember that. It was insane. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Don't worry, you're only going to lose a couple of pints. Yeah. The stuff cog layers can do is very mad science -y. It's wonderful. It's delightful. I love it. Genius, the creator. Um, yeah. <laughs> Basically, he no. was an auger. No. <laughs> yeah, he was an auger. Um, I have, we have to play genius. Not it. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. And it's not the creative, it's the transgression. Oh. So you got those two yeah, classes. Got those two classes. Um. And, you know, other classes become modified. Like if there's no forest or life in the wilderness anymore, of what use is there for a druid or for a ranger? Rangers, uh, they can select other type of terrain to still be useful. Yeah. Um, a desert forest. ranger? Yeah, desert ranger. Cog ranger is actually a thing now where you're, the environment that you're <laughs> protecting is you know keeping out animals and monsters that have evolved to... And coglings. Uh, coglings that prey on <laughs> damaged mechs. Because they're um, people. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, stuff like that. The subterranean druid alternate building is kind of a big thing now. Um, and there are some... Paladins things. are kind of screwed. 
Paladins are super screwed because it's a crapshoot whether or not your divine smite abilities are going to work. You just said spell casting, not smite. Yeah. Any divinely granted power. So even their protection against everything. May or may not function today. Crapshoot. Excellent role-playing possibilities. Yes. If you like to munchkin, not so much. What are you? I'm a paladin with a rocket launcher. I'm a paladin. Pa- the, the rocket launcher has thrown my faith in the gods is <laughs> lacking that day. Yeah. My rocket I'm, launcher has a name. Faith. I, I'm pretty sure we could find a way on the days when your smite is working to put it into the rockets. Here's the rocket variants plus for two uh, ranged paladin. What is this? I call this my smite missile. This is my little gun. What's the big one look like? <laughs> See, they're in the big gun. That needs some holy power over there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. This is It's a wonderful, wonderful setting. There's a lot of other politics going on. Like, There's a whole group of uh, nomadic humans that didn't like the, uh, the restrictions and militantness of the Stenian Confederacy, so they turned around and made their own independent clans. Um... Which is right where you guys got the party wipe in the macho. Yeah, here's the thing. <laughs> Do those are the guys we were dealing with? No. Oh. They were in the next chapter. You didn't get that. We, um, I don't like these people to begin with. We've only played this one time, a couple sessions. Three sessions. Trav ran it, and... We, there's a module to get you started. It's called Shards Fall. And That's not a shard. <laughs> I hope there, a, I well, hope it there might be a shard. I hope there was no shards. It's called uh, Shards Fall. Um, and it's meant to take you from levels 1 to 3, and it basically addresses and touches on all of the major parts of the setting, from the city mechs to the Stanian Confederacy to the Orc clans to the um, to the human renegade clans. Um, you can even potentially run into some elves along the way. But it introduces you to a lot of the lunar animal or lunar monsters and oh, some of the crazy shit that comes from there. Um, well, we can run into some elves. Can we run over them? Yes, we can. Yep. Good. Pilot. Good. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, like, the parts where Doug's mech jockey pilot would have been useful were after you got out of the dungeon where you guys went. Because the next thing that happens is you get that star shard and somebody steals it and steals a mech and you have to chase after them out to the clans. And mech combat. Out to the Iron Tooth clans. And one of the things to get inducted into the Iron Tooth clans is that you have to do one-on-one mech combat gladiatorial. Um, yeah. We kind of... Uh, and after that, the, the module sort of lets you decide whether you're going to stay with the clans or go back to the Confederacy. We, we kind of got Zerg-rushed and we ba- Well, we backed ourselves into a corner and then got Zerg-rushed. I was the last person to die, and I was trying to run for my life. It's like, well, shit, they went down, they went down. Oh, crap, he went down, too. I, I gotta go. And too late. I got rushed on a ladder, and that was it. Yep. yep. You're in the middle of a, a pack of mind controlled, cre- well, bodily controlled with the skin stealers, um, you know, crazy cultists and all that, stealing an artifact from this mm. temple that fell off the face mm. of the moon and landed upside mm. down. And I forget who, but somebody decided that they were just going to fight their way out. No, I didn't. I didn't have a rocket launcher. Yeah. No. It's literally a situation where you're supposed to be diplomatic and, you know. Or stealthy. Or stealthy. And I think we were going the stealthy round and then stealth Then we got failed. cornered and it stealth failed, failed and we, we had to fight. Our way out. Yeah. But, um, it was it was very fun. The, the three sessions that we played, I can't recommend this enough. I want to play it again. Marvelous thing. The only thing that I have a slight qualm about is actually mech combat. And they didn't get to this, but I read up on it extensively because we had a mech jockey in the group. I thought it was going to be a big thing. Um... Mechs are constructs, so they don't really have hit points. Uh, they, have, they do, but they don't. Yeah, they, don't. they have a condition track, mm-hmm. basically, uh, that really comes into effect when you score a critical hit. And this is where mech combat is both interesting and clunky. Um, like, say, you know, the, the dwarven mech winds up with his giant stone axe and scores a critical hit along your right flank, or your left flank as you hit him. It could disable your arm. It could cause a crack in the boiler. And Depends on what you yeah. rolled. Right. So where this becomes like a team-based exercise is even though you're the one who's piloting the mech, everyone else in the mech, everyone else in the mech is like struggling is, to weld that thing shut. It's basically, 
It's Guns of Icarus, essentially, is what it is. Yeah. It comes down to. Yep. Uh, it's another game I haven't played. If the Mexican I own it and haven't played it. But, yeah, so... I have a copy. I haven't played But because of this, it can be a long, drawn-out slugfest in someone. Yeah. Um, well, some... you didn't do any damage that turn. What did you we do? We disengaged their right gun by punching them in the kneecap. And the other thing that I, as the GM, is spo- am supposed to take care of, into account, these mechs are steam-powered. That means they have to have water on board to create steam. Whoever runs out of steam first... Loses. <laughs> Here, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to fire the orcs so they can board it and kill everyone on it. <laughs> um, and there's whole boarding rules and all that stuff, too, and that's kind of fun, but we didn't get to it. It's it's fun. I personally liked it. I want to revisit it. It's Trav is a fantastic GM. The, it's the a wonderful p- setting. The, the artwork associated in the book, um, although aside from the covers, everything is presented in black and white. Uh, it's still very thematic. It's very mood evoking. I love mm-hmm. it. Um, there's all kinds of crazy stuff. Like uh, on this planet, there's always been these giant subterranean worms, and now they're the primary source of meat and protein. A little bit of doing there. Yeah, a lot, a lot of doing there. Like um, it's it's. Marvelous. But they don't have any spice. Nope. No spice. No flow. Actually, they do have spice. Mm-hmm. They do flow. Not exactly spice, but there is flow. Um, you guys didn't quite make it to the trade city of Edge, uh, which is like the biggest stationary city on the face of the planet at this point, because half of it is located under the edge of a cliff, um, the other half of it is on top of the cliff, and then there's a, another entire city inside the cliff where it's safe from the uh, from the lunar rains. Oh, nice. And the way to get to this city is there's this waterfall that pours out of the cliff, and it's just this subterranean river that runs from one end of the continent to the other. Hmm. And... A lot of people ride this river from one end to the other in a, in a giant uh, mercantile loop. You come down the river with the flow underground, and then you catch a ride on a mech back during the appropriate season hmm. when it's safe to do so. Repeat annually. Um, and they actually have a splat book for that, The Eternal Traders. It's fantastic. That's cool. Um, but that starts getting into underdark stuff and the drow and the trade families and all that. And it's, it's I'm, I'm excited to play again. Mm-hmm. And, you know... I'm definitely going to be looking into those adaptations for 5th edition. It would be even better... Or even if, Pathfinder. Or Pathfinder, yeah. It would be even better if um, you know somebody could figure out who owns the rights to this thing at the moment and actually get an official... An update, yeah. Update. Spell and Sorcery, I'm not sure sword if they've... Sword sword, yeah, yeah, Spell and Sword and Sorcery, I'm not sure if they've gone defunct with White Wolf's changeovers. Probably. Nuts. I would imagine if anybody owns it, it's Onyx Path, so we'll never see Because, like, who owns Ravenloft right now? Uh, wait, or wizards, wizards, actually, because they got that it. means it reverted, it reverted from art house. Yeah. So, because um, they got the, the Strahd module yep. for fifth edition. Like, and we had never heard but of again, this. Again, it's only Strahd. It's just yeah. we never heard of this. This came out in two thousand four. Two thousand four, and we played it maybe about two years ago. Yep. I'd say. Well, they'd never heard of it. I actually had uh, from a free comic book day a catalog of coming soon stuff that I grabbed because it had a whole bunch of. Uh, White Wolf, Vampire the Masquerade, Demon the Fallen, Hunter the Reckoning stuff in the front. And the back page was this big splash ad for coming soon, summer 2014, Dragon Mech. 2004, not 2014. Uh, Yeah, 2004, Dragon Mech. Otherwise, well, this game is definitely less than Drake. Yeah. I'm like, well, that kind of looks interesting. I put it out of my mind until several years later when uh, a friend of ours, Ryan, was musing that there were no good games with mechs in them. And I that said, was well, <laughs> uh, he and I talked about quite a bit. Yep, hold that or hold that. Uh, hold Cthulhu Tech. Hold that we out. don't talk about Cthulhu Tech. Uh, we will talk a little bit about Probably. Cthulhu Tech, or have depending on your watch order. Oh. But that's uh, that's uh, an intro to High Point. I mean, there's amazing details. They wrote an entire book about just the city of Edge. Um, there's all kinds of books out there about the various clans. There's a whole book out there that's just about different ideas for custom building or pre-built custom mechs that you can ride around in and different things that they do. Um, one of them, for example, actually it's a, it's three mechs that work in tandem, the mother and children. The children are two little uh, mechs with giant buzz saws on them that go out and knock a, um, an enemy mech over. And the mother comes over and it's got these big tether cables that snap down and wrap around the, uh, the mech that's been so disabled and pulls it up into the womb, which is a big capture chamber because it's kind of built like the Technodrome on legs. 
and <laughs> they just capture mechs that way and carry them off to uh, you know either refit, retrofit them or salvage them or That's amazing. strip off their goods. Someone was really into unbirthing. A little bit. <laughs> um, a lot of these mechs are really Freudian. I was going to say fetishy, but Freudian's probably better. <laughs> Um, um, there's one that just looks like a giant, or one of the earliest dwarf models. Uh, it just looks like a giant rook from a game of chess because the dwarves originally envisioned like a walking turret <laughs> or a walking castle. <laughs> nice. All right, I'm uh, expecting at least one of these mechs is just going to be a giant gust of the railway gun. Yes. They have a hot air balloon attached to the end <laughs> of the barrel because it's so big it can't hold it up otherwise. Um, but the, yeah. the drow have a giant spider mech, naturally. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I gotta say, check it out, Dragon Mech. Um, if you can find a copy, because it's 2004. A... Dragon Mech, Goodman Games. Um, I think it's actually like the PDFs of it all over the place. Yeah. Um, can probably do print on demand. Yeah, and I, I actually did. Keep forgetting about that. I actually did print on demand for the City uh, City of Edge book. Uh, that's how I got it. So, yeah, you can still print on demand. It's still out there and available. Um, and you can either play it in its original format or update it to suit your, uh, your, your personal preference. Needs. Uh, I don't think it would translate very well to 4th edition. Yeah. Uh, then again, it's a shitty edition, so it's fine. If As you've played said, Dragon Mech... You're in the minority with us, please. Yeah, We'd like to hear from uh, you. We would love to hear <laughs> that. Um, if you're looking forward to playing Dragon Mech, tell us. Mm. Tell us why, actually, you know. Um, with that, you know, good night, good, night. good gaming. Good gaming. Hey guys, Vigo Rex here. If you like what you heard, go ahead and give us a little thumbs up with the like icon down below. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a comment. Apparently, you can comment, like, and share our videos on Facebook, BitChute, and Minds.com. If you want to watch a different video, look over here. And always, as always, good night and good gaming.